Hi everybody, uh, my name is John Lord. I am obviously your instructor for um, Accounting 100B, welcome back. Um, what we're going to do in this lecture is talk about the chapter 10 slides. Okay, so notice that down here we have chapter 10. I'm gonna post the lecture up here. We will also have, as you see, as I've already posted for chapter 11, slides, lecture for those slides, then I'll have a practice midterm. I will do a separate lecture for those practice midterms. I'll go through those with you. And so uh, that will be the main structure of the course. We will look at the slides together. We'll look at the practice lectures together. You have your homework that's in Wiley Plus. Very liberal on how we're looking at the homework. You can look at as many of those problems as you want. You don't have to look at all of them. And everyone will get the full homework points. It's really one point per chapter. Not a whole lot there. Okay. Now, if this is sounding, huh, how is that working? You need to look at this welcome video. I'm explaining the entire structure of the course right here in this welcome video. So I'd ask you to stop, go back and look at the um, welcome video here because I say you must start here because this really lays out how we're going to go through the course. You can see the syllabus and uh, if you're a little confused, well John, why is week two information posted before week one? There's a little bit of a miscommunication. Uh, we've recently changed the content of what gets covered in each of the uh, intermediate courses, uh, 100A, 100B, uh, 305 and it's accounting 305 and in that communication there's been some inconsistency so I was finally able to nail down okay these are the chapters that we're going to cover in 100A these are the chapters we're going to cover in 100B okay so you'll see on the syllabus we're going to cover chapter 10 so we're a little out of order as to how we're posting this information right now um, don't worry, uh, there's no harm if you looked at chapter 11 before you look at chapter 10, okay? But we're going to focus on the chapter 10 slides. Again, I recommend that you click on those, download those, have them available to you either in hard copy or on your tablet so you can make notes and mark up as I go along uh, through the information, okay? All right, great. So let's go ahead and let's just uh, put ourselves into slideshow mode okay and let's just take a look at chapter 10 and we're talking about property plan equipment okay we're not talking about current assets like cash and accounts receivable now we're talking about our long-term fixed assets property our factory building whatever um, our, our land I should say plant our factory building equipment equipment that we might be using in our factory etc right Okay, so when you take a look, we're going to be identifying um, what constitutes property, plant, and equipment, and uh, the related costs associated with that. And we're going to see that for the most part, we carry our property, plant, and equipment at historical cost. However, there, are, if there's an impairment, as we talked about in Chapter 11, we will write our assets down below that historical cost, okay? We're going to be talking about interest capitalization. We're going to see that if we have a qualifying asset, if we're incurring interest associated with the construction of that asset, they will allow us to capitalize construction period interest, okay? Uh, we're also going to talk about how will we uh, value our property plan equipment, again, historical cost, but we would have to write down our assets if there's some sort of impairment on those, which we talk more about in chapter 11 and then what happens if we have costs subsequent to acquisition we have to make an improvement we make an enhancement to an asset we have a repair how should we treat those should we add them to the asset account should we expense them as some sort of repair expense and we'll talk about the rules around that and then finally what happens when we dispose of property plan equipment so we go ahead and we sell the asset we'll have to recognize a gain or loss on that sale what happens if we don't sell it for cash, but we exchange it for another uh, piece of equipment, let's say? Well, we're going to see what the rules are around uh, what we call non-monetary exchanges, okay? Okay, good. So let's just go ahead and first take a look at what constitutes 
uh, property, plant, and equipment. Okay, so when we talk about property, plant, and equipment, if we're going to be putting it in our property, plant, and equipment section of our balance sheet, okay, then that means that that property needs to be used, that equipment, whatever needs to be used in operation. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that if we have, say, a piece of land and we're holding that land or we buy a building and we're holding that building in a speculative manner, we're going to flip it, right? We're going to see if the value of that thing goes up and then we're going to want to sell it at some point. Well, then we have a separate category on the balance sheet called investment property. And if that is called investment property, we no longer carry the historical cost. We will carry it at fair value and any uh, uh, gains and losses associated with that change from historical costs are reported on the income statement. Okay, so that's the requirement if you have investment type items that aren't being used in operations. If it's being used in operations, rules are what? It's going to be carried at historical cost. If it's a depreciable property, basically not land, then we'll have to record depreciation on that and if the value of that property falls below historical costs, we will have to take an impairment loss on that, which is more in chapter 11. We do not write up our property above historical costs. Now, we're not gonna get deep into IFRS in this class. I'm not gonna test you at all on RFRS, but where it seems appropriate to bring up something interesting where international finance reporting standards are different than US GAAP, I will, okay, so under IFRS, they do allow entities to write up their property plant equipment above historical costs. Now, the gain on that doesn't go directly to the income statement. It's included in something called other comprehensive income, which ultimately gets closed out to accumulated other comprehensive income, not retained earnings, on our uh, balance sheet. And so uh, IFRS handles things a little bit differently. Just a point of interest, I'm not going to test you on that, we're not going to have any examples of that, but I do want you to just kind of have out there the notion that, hey, IFRS does something a little different for our property plant and equipment here than uh, US GAAP does, which is to carry things at historical cost, okay? But to be qualified property plant and equipment, it has to be used in operations. They tend to be long-term. They tend to possess physical substance. And you're saying, well, why do you have to call that out? Of course, it's a physical substance, a piece of property. Well, there are some assets that we call intangible assets that we'll cover in chapter 12 that don't so much have a physical substance, but do have probable future economic benefit qualify as an asset and when we deal with those instead of talking about depreciating them we will talk about amortization of that value and i'm kind of getting a little bit into chapter 11 and way into you know more into chapter 12 as well don't worry guys we'll get into how to deal with intangible assets a little bit later okay so when we're talking about property plan equipment you can see the usual suspects here in land building structures factory office buildings equipment machinery furniture okay all right good so again as i've already stated we will be using historical cost we use historical cost because it is reliable what happens? Let's say I have a piece of land and I say, oh, that land is worth $10 million. Look at that land. It's perfect. I love this piece of land, $10 million. Okay. And somebody else looks at that and says, that's not worth $10 million. I wouldn't even give you a million for that. Somebody else comes in and says, no, that's worth $15 million. Because of the subjectivity related to the value of something like property plant equipment and even say, well, you could have it appraised. Well, appraisals go all over the place too. You know, if you're trying to get a loan on a piece of property and the uh, the lender requires an appraisal, and let's say you get that appraisal and then you decide, well, I'm not going to use this lender, I'm going to use another lender, guess what? The new lender is going to require a new appraisal. Well, that's telling you there's subjectivity even in the appraisal process. And so um, US GAAP just looked at that and said, you know what? Historical cost is reliable. What you paid for it is what you will value it at. And of course, if there's been some depreciation against that, historical cost minus the accumulated depreciation would give you a carrying value or book value. Those are synonymous terms. Carrying value, book value are synonymous terms as to what that would be carried on the uh, balance sheet. Okay, uh, We don't write it up above historical cost, uh, even though we maybe bought that property 
30 years ago, 40 years ago for 100,000, it's worth a million. US GAAP says, nope, carry that at historical cost, okay? Okay, good. So let's just come over and take a look now at some of the things that constitute our property plan equipment, starting with land, okay? Now, some of these things are pretty self-explanatory, guys, and it uh, seems a little uh, daunting when I'm gonna sit here and read through the list, and I'm reading through the list just so you start to have a little bit of a voice in your head as to what constitutes land, okay? But before we go through the details here, let's just put a picture in our mind okay cost of land is any cost that you incur to get the land ready for whatever you plan to do with it so let's say you're going to um, build a building on a piece of land that you buy you're going to put your office building and put your factory building on that piece of land okay what would you do you come in and there's a whole bunch of shrubbery and some rocks that you don't really want there in a tree that you'd like to move to a different location you have all of these different things that you're going to have to do with this piece of land so what happens any cost associated with clearing that land so you can get it nice and flat so you can begin to do what you want to to put a building let's say on there that's part of the cost of the land okay let's say there's an old structure sitting on that land you're like you know I'm just gonna get rid of that old structure I don't need that shack sitting there anymore I'm just gonna knock that thing down the cost of tearing down that shack would be part of the cost of the land okay so anything you have to do to clear that land to get it ready for whatever your purposes are is part of the cost of the land okay let's just get that visual in there kind of getting that land nice and flat so you can begin uh building on it okay maybe the you know the lot's kind of like this and you're like oh that's not gonna work for my purposes i'm gonna fill that in and i'm gonna level it off so it's nice and flat so I can begin building on it, part of the cost of the land, okay? So what do you have? You have the purchase price, closing costs, okay? Have to pay fees for the recording of title to the land. Maybe you had to pay a real estate person some money to help you find that land, whatever, okay? Cost of grading, filling, draining, clearing, getting it nice and flat, okay? If you took over any liens, let's say you tell the owner, okay, I see you following the previous owner. I see you falling behind on the property taxes. I'll tell you what, as part of the deal, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pay off the property taxes so it gets clear and free of title of any liens that might be there by the taxing authorities, etc. Okay. Any additional land improvements having an indefinite life. So what happens? Well, now you come in and you start planting some shrubberies and whatnot that you would want around your building. Those are part of the cost of the land. Why? Because they have an indefinite life, right? We're not going to sit there and say, well, you know, that tree only has a life of 300 years, so let's depreciate it. No, don't get into that nonsense. You're going to go ahead and you're going to uh, treat it as part of the cost of the land. And this is important, right? We need to figure out what constitutes land versus, pro uh, versus plant versus equipment because what well, land is not depreciated now you know sometimes i'll have a student say well, what happens if you had the land but the land went down in a landslide doesn't that mean that you know the land's depreciating well look you know eventually i guess the earth will explode into the sun or something you know but we don't sit there and consider those type of you know events that may be far off or maybe as a result of some sort of event like a you know earthquake or something at the time that that particular event occurs then we would write that land off you know sit there and anticipate you know acts of nature and whatnot okay okay good now you come over and take a look at what happens if you have a land improvement okay now land improvement with limited lives so now what do i do now i go and i put some fencing up or i put some sidewalk up i put a driveway there or something okay it's not part of the um property um portion of things at this point or part of the i should say uh um you know uh, building at this point but it would be considered a land improvement okay and land improvements are depreciated so we're talking about driveways fences parking lots those are land improvements those are depreciated every now and then you'll have to replace the fence every now and then you'll have to replace that driveway as it starts to get old and cracks or whatever okay if you want to make it look better 
whatever it is okay now as I've said if you have acquired land and you're acquiring it because you want to sit there and hold it for some sort of speculative purposes you're gonna hold it for a while see how real estate prices are going you plan to sell it you plan to flip it then that land is not carried as part of property plan equipment it is carried in an investment property and it would be carried at fair market value under that scenario under US GAAP okay so we would carry that under fair market value if we're a real estate company then we would carry that land as inventory and like all inventory then right we would carry that land at the lower of cost or market because that's what US GAAP tells us we need to do with our inventory in most cases okay okay good come over and let's take a look at the cost of the building okay and cost of the building okay and you need to think now I've got the land nice and flat now I'm gonna start doing things to that land so that I can put a building there so what's maybe the first thing you need to do I need to dig a hole for the foundation right I'm gonna lay my foundation I'm gonna put the framing around for the foundation all of those sort of things that start to happen so that you can build a building okay so um, the building includes any cost related to the development of that building including sitting there and um, building the um, foundation digging a hole in the land right we have the land nice and flat digging a hole for the foundation okay so materials labor overhead cost professional fees building permits how about the cost of the planning how about the cost of the blueprints we got to call in an architect yeah cost of blueprints write that in because sometimes you might not think of that as being part of the cost of the building yes it is it's part of the cost of the building okay okay good anything you do to get that land ready for that building that you plan to put on it now that becomes part of the cost of the building okay okay good now you come over <coughs> and uh, take a look at the cost of equipment okay now when you look at the cost of equipment okay and sorry guys I know it's a little annoying as I fight with my uh, pens here um, I'm not sure why Microsoft doesn't give us a palette of colors that we can use here when we're in uh, slideshow mode seems logical that I would want to have a palette of colors there that I could just click in but they hide that um, that uh, place where I'm supposed to get the colors and how you switch over from highlighter to pen and colors is a whole thing okay but anyway we go ahead and uh, so bear with me okay guys I know it's a little annoying but we go through and we say that all expenditures associated with acquiring the equipment and preparing it for its use our costs that we'll include for equipment so it sounds very similar to what we said about the building right anything you got to do to get that land ready for the building anything you do for the building is going to be what getting it getting it ready for that purpose digging the hole for the foundation because that's related to the building then that's going to be part of the cost of the building getting the land flat so that you can start the process of what you're going to do to build on it, which is part of the building, but getting the land nice and flat, that's part of the cost of the land, okay? So we have what? Purchase price, freight and handling charges to bring that equipment, okay? Insurance on the equipment as you go along, okay? If you have to put in a foundation to, in order to bring that equipment, maybe it's particularly heavy equipment, need some bolstering you just can't put it on the floor of the factory building or it's going to break through you have to build a foundation for that part of the cost of the equipment installing it so you can affix it to the rest of your equipment okay cost of trial runs all of these things you're getting the equipment ready for construction ready for use in your business i should say is part of the cost of the equipment okay now i want to go back because i want to make sure that i cover something um, on the uh, cost of the building, uh, excuse me, the cost of the land. Um, and for some reason, I'm not seeing it here, so it might come up later, but I want to make clear that um, if we have to tear down, say, an old building, okay, the cost of tearing down that old building, 
part of the cost of the land because we're getting the land ready so we can start the process of the building okay but let's say when we tear down that building uh, we say you know what if you look at the doors that are in this old building that we're going to tear down those doors are classic doors from the 1920s there's a value for those they've got some sort of art deco carvings on them or something we're not just going to destroy those doors and knock them down what we're going to do is we're going to remove all the doors and we're going to sell those doors to somebody that's an antique building refurbisher or something like that. Well, whatever we sell those for, those proceeds would come off of the cost of the land for us, okay? So you may want to tear down the building. The cost of tearing it down is going to add to the cost of land, but if you're able to take part of that scrap and somehow sell it, you get a salvage value out of that, that comes off the cost of the land. And when we go through the practice midterm, you will definitely see uh, some examples like that uh, coming up. Okay, okay, good. Now, if we have a self-constructed asset, okay, let me catch, catch myself up here to slide 10. If you have a self-constructed asset, okay, um, we're going to see that includes our overhead cost, and we will basically, in most cases, apply a portion of our overhead cost to the construction. Okay, so if we're allocating, say, a certain amount of our overhead, our um, indirect um, salaries, let's say, okay, and we have various projects going on, we might apply some of that overhead to, say, our inventory because we have indirect labor there but some of that overhead would um, need to be allocated to the actual construction of something that we're using, uh, of, of something that we're constructing, and that would, of course, be capitalized as part of the, part of the property plan and equipment account. Okay, good. Now you come over and we take a look at um, how to handle uh, some of these costs, and, you know, I'm just going to clip through these here with you. Um, you know, this is a little bit of a funny exercise. You know, money borrowed. If you borrow money, debit, cash, credit, note, payable. Okay. But let's just take a look. Payment uh, for the uh, construction from note proceeds. So I borrow a million dollars. I have the million dollars. I debit, cash, I credit, note, payable. Now I got to uh, take that million dollars and start to pay my uh, construction workers, that sort of stuff. That's part of the building. Okay, cost of land filling and clearing. We've talked about that being part of the land. We pay um, on delinquent taxes. That's part of the land. Okay, if we have to have uh, policy insurance policy during construction, why are we having an insurance policy for the construction to help us actually build the building? That becomes part of the cost of the building. Okay. They give us a refund of some of the insurance. That would be subtract off the building, okay? Coming over, and I'm gonna go ahead and just, I don't see that we need to create any mystery here, okay? Driveway, land improvement, commission fee paid to the real estate agency that found us that land, part of the cost of the land. Uh, fences, land improvements, cost of raising, tearing down the old building, part of the cost of the land, uh, cost of real estate purchase as part of the plant site, uh, land and building. Um, I'm not sure why they're just specifically calling that out here as a land. Um, well, if we're going to tear down the building, then yeah, the entire purchase price of 250000 I guess, in this case, would be uh, attributed to the land if we're going to tear down the building. If we're going to use the building, then we would be required to take that entire purchase price and allocate it accordingly to the land and building. We call that a basket purchase. And I'm going to show you an example here in a little while how you would handle basket purchase. So in this case, since we're attributing the entire purchase price um, of 250000 that's all part of the land. Okay, and then uh, proceeds, there it is, I knew it was in there somewhere, proceeds from the salvage value come off of the cost of the land. Okay, if we're able to sell those doors or whatever, you know, I don't know, something of value associated with the building that we're tearing down, we pull all those doors out, we put them off to the side, we sell them to a door dealer, 
Okay, um, that proceeds that come in would come off, would be subtracting the cost of the land. Okay, and so on. Okay, guys, uh, I don't think we need to kill ourselves going through. Uh, cost of trees, shrubbery, those are considered more permanent. Those become part of the cost of the land. Okay, now again, just to make sure that we are um, clear on why this is important because you're like well why are we making such a big deal out of what's land what's property what's uh plant like our factory building what's equipment because our what our property our plant and our equipment our plant and our equipment are not land assets will need to be depreciated land is not depreciated okay okay good let's go ahead and let's talk about interest capitalization Okay, now what happens here? We're going to borrow money. And we're going to use that money to allow us to construct a building that we're going to use for our, um, our use in our uh, business, in our operations. Okay, well, um, we are allowed, GAP allows us to capitalize the interest that we pay on that borrowing because we're constructing an asset that we're going to use in our operations. Let's say instead of borrowing the money to construct assets that we're going to use in our operations, let's say we borrow money to construct an asset like a cruise ship. We're going to sell that cruise ship to, I don't know, Royal Caribbean. We're a shipbuilder. We're going to sell it to one of these cruise ship people. We're going to sell the ship to military, to the Navy or something like that. And we borrow the money to allow us to construct that specific to the contract of the buyer the cruise company, the military, whatever it is. Under those circumstances, then we can capitalize that interest. Now, that is different than if we were to borrow money so that we can construct inventory of homogeneous items like pens so that then we have inventory that we can sell to different you know, stores that sell pens and whatnot. That kind of borrowing on routine manufacturing, eh, you cannot capitalize the interest, okay? So it has to be a specific special construction contract in order for us to be able to capitalize the uh, interest on that, okay? So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at uh, how this area works and what some of the key points are. Now, you start out and GAP requires that you capitalize the interest, okay? That you capitalize that interest. And we're gonna be seeing how they will, uh, the, the rules that they give us as to how we'll determine how much interest to capitalize, okay? Now, you come over and again, the two types of assets where we can consider capitalizing interest is assets under construction for the company's own use. We're going to be building our factory building, building our office buildings. We borrow the money. Since we're going to be using that in our operations, we can capitalize the interest on that following the rules that we're about to go through here in a couple of seconds. Or assets intended for sale or lease that are constructed as part of a discrete project. Okay, so what that word discrete project is trying to say to you, what that word discrete is trying to say to you is, hey, it's not your retune, you borrowed money to routinely manufacture 20 million pens that you can sell to whoever. You can't capitalize that sort of interest as part of your cost of your, part of your inventory. If I have a contract that's saying, hey, you will build this ship to these specifications, right? If it's a military ship, you know, you're going to have to include some cannon turrets or whatever. I don't obviously don't know anything about military ships. If it's a, a cruise ship, you need to build a beautiful dining room in the middle of that and a dance floor, whatever, okay? So it's going to be different depending on the specific contract. You borrow money under those circumstances to construct that asset that's being made specifically to the specifications of the purchaser. Yeah, okay, now you can capitalize the interest uh, associated with that construction, okay? So that's what, that's the qualifying assets right there. <sighs> That's the qualifying assets that you see right there. Okay, go back to highlighter. Okay, give me yellow. Okay, that's the qualifying assets right there. But when can we start to capitalize this interest? Okay, and the answer is it begins when expenditures for the assets have been made, activities readying the asset 
uh, are in progress and interest costs are being incurred. So what does that mean? Well, it means you have to have borrowed the money. And you know, when you borrow money, interest starts running from the moment you borrow it, right? Okay, and so the cost of borrowing money is interest, right? You borrow money, interest is running immediately. Okay, so the interest costs are being incurred, meaning essentially you borrowed the money. Activities for renting the asset are in progress. So it doesn't mean that you have to actually be hammering nails or digging things. It means that you are doing things like getting permits to allow you to build on that land, going through inspections that allow you to build on the land, making the blueprints, etc. And then of course, as what? As you um, start to actually build that asset, Okay, then you're sitting there and you are, um, you know, incurring uh, the cost to um, to build that asset, to construct that asset. Okay, so let's just kind of think about this for a second. So let's say I buy a piece of land. Okay, I borrow some money, I buy a piece of land. And I'm going, I'm thinking, okay, I'm either going to... Um, I don't know what I'm going to do with this land. I borrowed money. I'm incurring the interest. Okay. I borrowed the money. I'm incurring the interest, but I'm not sure what I want to do with this land. Okay. And one of the things I may do is I may go ahead and build something on it, construct my office building on it, but I haven't decided. Okay. Well, the interest that I'm incurring while I'm making up my mind as to whether I'm going to construct an asset for use by the company, I can't capitalize that interest during that time. Okay, let's say six months go by and now I say, okay, yeah, I'm going to use that land to, um, to uh, build my office building, right? And I start applying for permits and whatnot. So now what happens? Now I am now making expenditures, right, towards the uh, getting that ready for the purpose of building, constructing an asset that I'm going to use for my personal use, for the company's use, right? Um, activities are in progress. I'm applying for permits and whatnot. I've already, for the first six months, was incurring interest costs. So I'm incurring interest costs. So now, instead of expensing interest, any interest that's incurred from that point forward would now start to be interest that would be capitalized as part of the cost of the building. Okay. Now, it ends when the asset is substantially complete and ready for use. So what happens? Let's change up the, the, um, the story a little bit. Let's say I'm building some assets, some homes, and I'm building those homes, and I'm capitalizing the interest associated with those homes that I'm building, and then all of a sudden I finish the homes, and I have, say, a couple of them that are sitting there as standing inventory, right? And at that point, I'm waiting to see what's going to happen if the market's going to improve and whatnot. And those houses are just sitting there and they're not sold yet. I have to stop capitalizing the interest because I'm no longer making expenditures to complete that project. Okay, I'm sitting there and I've built um, a condo. Okay, and I've built that condo and some of the floors um, are, are um, sold and some of the other floors are still sitting unsold. What happens? I can no longer capitalize the interest on that project because I have finished the construction, okay? So it goes long as long as these three factors are being encountered, and even though you may be still incurring interest cost, if you don't have these other two, such as there's activities readying the asset or expenditures uh, to construct the asset are being made. I'm done with construction. I'm just sitting there with a constructed building waiting for that next step when somebody's going to come along and purchase that or whatever. Then um, that is going to be uh, something that's where I am not going to uh, continue to capitalize the interest on that. Okay. Okay. Now, how much should be capitalized? All right. And it's the lesser of the actual interest cost or avoidable interest. Now, when we talk about avoidable interest, it's the interest that would be uh, incurred, would, would not have been incurred if I wasn't actually involved in constructing this asset and had borrowed money to construct that asset, okay? So what that means is as we go through, 
we're going to have to go through a series of steps and we're going to go through those steps together here and using this fact pattern that you see on the screen for you now and we'll continue through this uh, example and I think all of these rules which maybe seem a little difficult to understand right now will be very clear to you as we go through this example okay so don't worry this stuff is not that hard okay so first thing do we have a qualifying asset are we constructing the asset under contract or for our um, for you know to, to specific specifications that's kind of redundant I'm not gonna get a Pulitzer Prize for that uh, to to unique specifications okay let's say it that way am I constructing it according to unique specifications or am I constructing it for my own use and operations that's the qualifying asset okay then what are activities going on okay second point are activities going on that will allow me to capitalize that interest where the activities interest has to be being incurred I have to be starting to prepare the asset for the construction. So things like blueprint and uh, inspections will count. And I'm making expect, uh, expenditures to actually construct that asset. Now I'm starting to pay for workmen and equipment and that and whatnot to uh, allow me to actually build that thing. Now I can start capitalizing the interest. Okay. Now, once I have met those three requirements, right, then I can sit there and say, okay, uh, I have activities going on, I have a qualifying asset, I have the qualify the activities going on. So once that starts, now I can start treating any interest that's accrued during that time as part of the cost of the asset. I'm going to capitalize that interest. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have to look at the interest rate associated with that specific borrowing. So as you look at our practice midterm questions, you're gonna to have to get used to pulling out the interest rate that is quoted for the specific borrowing related to that project. I will apply that interest to something called the weighted average of accumulated expenditures. That will be the minimum amount. That will be, I know I'm gonna to have to pick up at least that much interest. So I'm gonna calculate the amount of interest that I'm gonna capitalize doing that. Now, what happens if my weighted average of accumulated expenditures exceeds the amount of borrowing specifically related to that project? Well, I have to add on some more interest onto that, okay, based on the uh, average borrowing of all other borrowings of the company. So I may have to make an adjustment to applying the specific interest rate related to that borrowing to my uh, weighted average of cumulative expenditures if my weighted average of accumulate uh, for that amount of borrowing up to the amount of borrowing if my weighted average of accumulated expenditures exceeds that then i have to sit there and apply uh, additional uh, interest rate which be the average bar of all other borrowings of the company then i need to once i've done that then i need to look and see if the amount that I've just calculated is more than the overall interest of the company, then I'm capped at that overall interest. If it's less, then I'll take that entire amount. Okay, now I know you're sitting there saying, huh? hang on guys, let's look at the example. I'm just giving you a, a overview of where we're going so we can start to look at some of this information here and see what we know we're gonna have to pick up. Okay, so company borrowed what? 200,000 to 12% interest, okay? Now I'm highlighting that because now I know the interest rate associated with that and I know the specific borrowing related to this project, okay? I borrowed 200,000 for the specific purpose and I borrowed that on January 1st for the specific purpose of constructing special pur purpose equipment to be used in operations. Okay, qualifying asset, all right? Construction of the equipment began on January 1st. Okay, activity started simultaneously with the borrowing. If activities came later than the borrowing, then I would only be able to capitalize an interest after those activities began. But the activities began and they start to tell me now what the expenditures are through December 31st, 2020. Okay, and they tell me what the expenditures are and we're going to use this information to help us calculate the weighted average of accumulated expenditures. Okay, so I'm just going to put a little note up there. Okay, use to calculate the 
weighted average. And guys, my uh, writing has never been good, and it's even worse with the uh, tablet, okay? So uh, just kind of write it as I say it more than just trying to look at the screen. Just listen to my voice. Use to calculate weighted average. of accumulated expenditures okay okay good that's the information right here we're going to use for that okay now we know we have the 12 percent what happens if the weighted average of accumulated expenditures is more than two hundred thousand? Well, then we're going to have to calculate an interest rate associated with all other borrowing of the company, and we'll use that interest rate to apply to amounts that are in excess of the 200000 assuming my weighted average of accumulated expenditures exceeded the $200,000. we will use that interest rate to figure out the amount of interest to capitalize on this project over and above the specific borrowing, the 200000 Hang on, guys. Don't panic. Let's start to take a look, okay? So again, this is a qualifying asset, right? It's uh, special purpose equipment, whatever. Determine the capitalization period begins January 1st, okay? Okay, good. Weighted average of accumulated expenditures. And what we do is we figure out how long the expenditures were outstanding. So we had what? We had uh, actual expenditures during 2020, 100,000. And then we went ahead and we spent another 150,000. So the 100,000 was outstanding the entire time. That additional 150,000, since we didn't borrow that until April, that 150,000 was only outstanding eight twelfths of the year. And so we go ahead and just apply eight twelfths to that 150,000. 300,000, right, was spent on November 1st. So that was only outstanding November, December, two months. I like to count on my fingers for questions like this because I mess up the month all the time unless I count, okay? All of November, all of December is two months. And then notice, since we didn't spend that 100,000 until what? Until December 31st, it was not outstanding any portion of the year. Okay, so when we use the weighted average of accumulated expenditures, we come up with 250000 Now what happens? The specific borrowing on the project was what? 200000 Okay, 200000 that whatever it was, 12% interest rate. So we'll use that what? We have to select the appropriate interest rate. Okay, and for up to 200000 of that, that's going to be on the specific borrowing. But for the amount, what, 50000 in our little example here, because our weighted average of accumulated expenditures was 250000 that amount um, is going to be... Uh, using the uh, average borrowing for all other borrowings of the company okay so let's go ahead and let's take a look at how that's gonna work and I just want to get myself caught up with my pages here okay so what happens there's the 200,000 the specific borrowing remember on that project was 12 percent that's 24,000 right but what happens we had 250,000. So what interest rate should we apply to that excess over the weighted average over the the amount of weighted average of accumulated expenditures in excess of the specific borrowing the 200,000 that 50,000 right there, right? That's for the specific borrowing right there, that 50,000. What interest rate should we use? Well, the problem told us that they had what? They had 500,000 on other borrowings of the company. We're calling general debt there. And it was 14%. These interest rates seem a little high. It was 14% compared to current interest rates. But anyway, stop, John. That's not important here. 14% for what? For our uh, 500,000 of borrowing and 10% for the 300,000. So that means that we have interest, right, of 100,000 on what? On borrowings here of 800,000. Okay, we're just picking up those numbers. Okay, and so what happens? We take that 100,000, the interest divided by 
the amount borrowed that that interest rate was uh, incurred on, accrued on, that's that 800,000. And so we end up with what, 12.5% is the average interest rate for other borrowings of the company. We apply that interest rate to the amount of weighted average of accumulated expenditure in excess of the 200,000. We add those two numbers together. That's the amount of interest we're thinking of capitalizing here. However, our final step is we can't capitalize more interest than our actual interest cost. And so when we go ahead and we compare our actual interest, which is what? It's the 24,000 on the borrowing plus the 100,000 on all other borrowing, right? That's where we get the 124. Obviously, our uh, avoidable interest that we just calculated is less than that. So we can go ahead and we can capitalize now 30,250. If for some reason the avoidable interest was more than the actual interest, we'd be capped at the actual interest. And so we go ahead and notice, guys, we don't debit um, our, um, um, uh, I guess they're saying that they had originally, this is more of an adjusting entry approach. I guess they're saying that they had originally ex shown all that interest as interest expense. We're adjusting that, taking it out of interest expense and going ahead and putting that in the equipment account, thus capitalizing the equipment. So this would be more of an adjusting entry. Hey, you put everything in interest expenses and it's incurred, but by year end, a CPA would come in probably and have to do all this, decide you know how much is supposed to go to the equipment account. Or maybe the company does that themselves, um, or sometimes CPAs will come in and ask for an adjustment. Okay? Okay, good, guys. Now, I am not going to go through this next example because I think we've had a nice little exercise here where we've gone through the um, example together. However, I do want you on your own. That's why I left these slides in here to go through and look at these various slides that... Um, and at what about slide uh, third okay so about five slides i want you to look at those on your own so that you again go through the steps in the process and uh you know refamiliarize yourself or practice on that one more time with this example okay all right guys i'm thinking you're ready for a break i know i am so I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause us for a second, okay? And when we return, we'll pick up here with, uh, um, well, you know what? Yeah, okay, since I've gone that far, I'm going to pause on the break. Um, I probably should have gone ahead to go to slide 31 uh, and done this right now, but that's okay. We'll come back and we'll do that here, what will be as short or as long as you like okay so i'm going to pause here for a second and then we'll come back and uh, talk about this uh, how to present construction period interest and then we'll move on to some other topics okay all right guys see you in two seconds okay guys let's go ahead and um just wrap up our discussion of uh, capitalizing construction period interest and um, note that this presentation that they're providing here uh, could be provided on the uh, face of the income statement which is sort of what they're um, contemplating here that this is how it would look on the face of the income statement um, most likely um, you'd probably see this more in the notes. I don't think they're going to muddy up their income statement with all this, but um, you can see, and I think I understand now why they first had uh, debited interest expense for the entire interest and then credited interest expense and debited the uh, asset that they were constructing in the journal entry we saw earlier because you would want to report your total interest expense and then back off the amount that was associated with the capitalized interest um, so that you get, you know, the amount of uh, actual interest that was expensed on the income statement um, net and then uh, go from there. Again, this is contemplating a presentation that uh, 
if they showed it on the face of the income statement. But uh, basically, you have to uh, disclose the amount of interest capitalized either on the income statement on the notes, but that's got to be disclosed. Okay, presented somewhere. Okay, all right, good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let you look at some of these special issues on your own. Um, well, let's look at them. That's okay. It, uh, we'll look at them together. Uh, if the company purchased land as a site for a structure, interest costs capitalized are part of the cost of the plant, uh, not the land. Okay. Conversely, if the company develops lands for lot sales and includes any capitalized interest as part of the acquisition costs of the uh, developed land because they're developing that land. Okay. Um, and then finally, uh, interest revenue. Um, company should not offset interest revenue against interest cost. Okay, so some self-explanatory sort of things there uh, that wraps up our discussion of capitalizing interest. Now, what we're going to do at this point is turn our attention now to what we will do when we are acquiring assets and then we'll get into a disposal of these assets here in a little while. Okay, so let's just take a look and um, again, companies will report property plant, plant and equipment at the fair value for what they're giving up, okay, or at the fair value of the asset received, whichever is more clearly evident, okay? Now, that's important, whichever is more clearly evident, okay? So what happens? Let's say we issue stock in exchange for... Um, what we have given up okay so we issue some stock and we get the asset that received well which one has a more clearly evident value well if we're sitting there and our stock is traded then we have what we have the agreement whatever the stock price is at the end of the year if we're dealing with a stock that isn't traded well then maybe the asset that we're acquiring has a more uh, evident uh, value so we'd have to look at um, either the fair value of what we've given up or the fair value of the asset received. Again, whichever is more clearly evident and you'd pretty much be able to see that from the construct of any question I would give you where they'll make it clear which one, we'll make it clear which one is more clearly evident from the language of the question. We don't expect you to sit there and pull out of the sky which one is more clearly evident. The, the question that I would give you would call that out specifically, okay? Okay, good. Now, when we consider the value, of course, if we get a discount because we pay that early, that discount would come off of the uh, invoice price for that particular item, right? So you, you pay in 210 net 30. If we get a cash discount, we would need to consider that, okay? Uh, deferred payment contracts, okay? Asset purchase on a long-term credit contract at present value of the consideration exchanged. Okay, now we talk about um, the um, uh, lump sum purchase often referred to as a basket purchase. Okay, so let's just put in, and I'm going to give you a little example here. We kind of alluded to this example earlier, but let's say, okay, I'm just going to squeeze in an example right here. Okay, it's not related to deferred payment, but I'm just going to co-op some of this space up here where this whole thing that I'm going to be using, I'm just going to carve off this space right here, okay, is for our discussion here of, um, looks like I limited myself too much. Sorry, guys, I just want to make sure that it's clear as you're looking at this that the example that I'm giving is relevant to the lump sum purchase. I don't know if I've held myself or not. Okay. Okay, good. So what happens? Let's say I purchase this is the example land plus building for five hundred thousand dollars. So I find a building that might be nice for my business. 
they want 500,000, I pay them 500,000. Of course, the lands don't, buildings don't float in air, they're on land, right? So we have the land in the building, $500,000 that I pay for it. Now, how much of that should go to the land versus how much should go to the building? And it matters because we're gonna depreciate the building, we're not gonna depreciate the land, right? So what we would do is get appraised value Okay, and we would get appraised value of the land. And let's say the appraised value of the land is 100,000. Okay, and then we would get an appraised value of the building. Okay, of the building. And let's say that was 300,000. Now you look at that and you say, well, wait a minute, John, why would somebody pay 500,000 for a land with building 500,000 when the appraised value is 400,000? Well, they appraise that land as though it didn't have that particular building on it. They appraise that building as though it was not on that particular land. And when they do that, then they got kind of a unique praised value for the two uh, pieces of this. They call it lump sum purchase. You could call it a basket purchase, okay? Now, what happens? If we want to figure out now how much of the purchase price should go to the land, okay? Let me make that look a little better. L-A-N-D is land, okay? And so the land is going to be the 500,000, the cash, times what? Times 100,000 divided by 400,000 or 25% or 125,000. That much would be allocated to the land. Credit cash 500, debit land 125,000. And then for the building, we would take that again, 500,000 times now what 300,000 divided by the 400,000 which constitutes 75 percent so that would be what of that um, 125 uh, of that excuse me 500,000 375,000 would go to the building okay pretty straightforward but that's what you would do in that sort of a scenario Okay. Now again, they mentioned the issuance of stock, and I think the book's a little, little uh, sort of being a little presumptuous here. They say that the market value of the stock issued is fair indication of the cost of the property acquired mm, if the stock is listed. Yeah. Okay. You know, they ring the bell at the end of the stock exchanges, and we all agree as to what the value of a company's stock is. Well, what if that stock is not trading? actively on some market. It could be that the asset that you're acquiring has a more readily determined value and then you would leverage off the value of the property that you're acquiring. So if, you know, a fleet of cars has a more readily determined value uh, and you're, you're having to pay 500000 for that, debit the cars 500000 credit the common stock at par, and then for any amount over, the, let's say the common stock at par had a value of 100,000, credit common stock for 100,000, credit additional paying capital for 400,000. So it doesn't have to be that the stock has a more readily determined value. It could be that it's a stock, but it could be that the asset you're acquiring has a more readily determined value and you're simply exchanging the stock. So what happens? We have a gain Okay, let me get my pen back. We have a gain, and I need to change the color. We have a gain if the fair market value of that asset that you're getting rid of is greater than the book value. Book value, as you know, is the original cost minus any accumulated depreciation that's been recorded up to the date of sale on that um, asset, okay? Now, we have a loss, as you well know, I'm sure, if the fair market value is what? Now the far, fair market value is less 
than the book value. If that's the case, we have a loss. Okay, so we would have to calculate that gain or loss. Okay, now the question becomes, do we recognize, do we record in the financial statements those gains, those losses? Okay, and it's going to depend on whether or not the transaction has commercial substance. Okay, transaction either has commercial substance or a transaction will, of course, if it doesn't have it, right? You either have hair or you don't have hair. You lack hair if you don't have hair, right? So you either have commercial substance or you lack commercial substance. Those are the two possibilities. You have commercial substance or you lack commercial substance. Okay, now what happens? Um, a transaction has commercial substance if cash flows will change significantly. as a result of the transaction. If cash flows change significantly as a result of the transaction, that transaction is determined by US GAAP to have commercial substance. So let's go back to our example. We're trading what? We're trading cars for a building. Well, the cash flow that you generate off of a fleet of cars is gonna be different than the cash flows that you would generate from a building, right? Building might have a 50 year life, cars maybe three year life or something. So the cash flows are probably gonna change significantly. That transaction would have would probably have commercial substance. Now, just looking at this from a testing standpoint, how I'm gonna test you on this, I will either tell you that the transaction has or lacks commercial substance in a question, or I will say, cash flows are gonna change significantly, that means the transaction has commercial substance, or I'll tell you cash flows are not gonna change significantly, meaning that transaction lacks commercial substance, okay? So, what happens? We have a transaction that has commercial substance, lacks commercial substance, right? Now, this is how the rules work, because remember we started out this thing talking about, hey, you gotta calculate gains and losses, okay? Always take losses. Always take losses. I'm gonna be annoying here, I'm gonna say it three times. Always take losses. I don't care if it's a monetary transaction, non-monetary transaction. I don't care if the transaction has commercial substance or lacks commercial substance. Always take losses. Rule of conservatism always wins. And to be more conservative, we always take losses immediately. Okay, so you don't care. If I tell you it's a loss situation, you're gonna take the loss, okay? Whether the transaction has commercial substance or not. Now, what we're gonna see is, well, then you're saying, okay, got it. We have a non-monetary transaction. We're giving up an asset. We have to calculate the gain or loss, have a loss. I gotta take the loss whether the transaction has commercial substance or not. What about gains, okay? So how will we handle gains? If the transaction has commercial substance, then we are gonna take the gain. Okay, pretty easy there too. Take the losses, take the gains if the transaction has commercial substance. If the transaction lacks commercial substance, always take the losses, but what do we do in the gain situation? Okay, and now it starts to depend on how cash is involved in that transaction. If there's no cash involved in the non-monetary transaction that lacks commercial substance, Nobody recognizes a gain, no gains. Nobody recognizes any gains because there's no cash, okay? Now, if cash starts to be involved in the transaction, you're gonna have to look to how much cash is involved in the transaction and who is somebody receiving the cash or paying the cash, okay? So let's deal first with the situation that the cash is considered a small part of the transaction. What do we mean by small? If the amount of cash constitutes less than 25% of the overall consideration and we're in a lacking commercial substance situation, 
the entity receiving cash will take a portion of that gain. And the portion of that gain is going to be constituted by how much of the cash, cash in the numerator, constitutes of the entire fair market value of the transaction, cash plus the fair market value of whatever else was involved in that transaction in the denominator. And if that percentage is less than 25%, then the person receiving the cash, the entity receiving the cash, will only take that portion of the gain. How do we calculate gain? Fair market value is um, more than the book value, right? We'd only take a portion of that gain. The entity paying the cash, okay, not receiving the cash, would take no gain in that situation. That's when the cash constitutes less than 25% of the total consideration. When the cash starts to constitute 25% or more of the total consideration, then both the entity paying the cash and receiving the cash will take the entire gain, 100% of the gain, okay? All right, now I'm saying that to you and you're like, okay, can you show me that in writing somewhere? And so let's just go ahead and let's take a look. Um, sorry guys, I'm gonna catch up my slides here. Let's take a look at the next slide now where we start to look at um, transactions and how we will handle them based on this issue of commercial substance, okay? So again, as I had, uh, I think written on that previous slide, but let's just look at it here. Exchange has commercial substance if future cash flows change as a result of the transaction, okay? Now, if the cash flows don't change significantly, then what? Then we lack commercial substance. We either have commercial substance or we lack it. You either have hair or you lack hair, right? Okay. Now, what happens? Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, an interesting thing about IFRS. IFRS sticks with this idea of similar or dissimilar assets. So if we have similar assets, then uh, IFRS says, hey, that transaction, you should take the gain. Uh, you should, if we have dissimilar assets, like my example, cars for a building, then you go ahead and you're going to take the full gain. We'll treat it as though it has commercial substance. IFRS says that if it's similar assets, treat it as though it lacks commercial substance. But that's IFRS. I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to leave you guessing. Okay. I'm going to either tell you the transaction has or lacks commercial substance. I'm going to either tell you that the cash flows will change or won't change significantly. Change significantly has commercial substance. Won't change significantly lacks commercial substance. Okay. Now let's just go ahead and uh, take a look at the table here. Okay. And let's first look for losses. So we have what? Exchange has commercial substance. Exchange lacks commercial substance, exchange lacks commercial substance, okay? And so whether the transaction has commercial substance or what, lacks commercial substance, okay? What do we do with losses? Losses immediately. Take the loss immediately, entire loss, I don't care. Has commercial substance, lacks commercial substance. If you have a loss situation, Book value is more than fair market value. Fair market value is less than the book value. However you want to look at that, take that entire loss. Okay, so what do we do with the gains then? Okay, so let's go ahead and I guess we'll use this light green for the gains. Okay, if the transaction has commercial substance, recognize the gain. Lacks commercial substance, no cash is involved, everybody defers the gains. Okay, if the transaction has commercial substance and cash is received, then recognize the partial gain, okay? If the cash received is 25% or more of the fair value, then recognize the entire gain, okay? And I want you to put down there, just to clarify that, okay, because they don't really put that on the slide for some reason. Both payer and receiver of cash recognize entire 
gain. Okay. All right. So that so let's just look at that situation again. No cash received. No cash. Let's just put instead of no cash received, just put no cash involved there. I think it's a little better. There's no cash involved in the transaction. Then what? Defer the game. Defer the entire game. Don't recognize it. Okay. Now what happens if you're sitting there and cash uh, is involved, right? And the cash constitutes less than 25% of the total consideration, then the entity receiving the cash will take what? Will take a partial gain, okay? The entity what? The entity paying the cash, what? Will not take any gain, okay? So let's put that down. Entity paying cash, no gain. Assuming there that the what, cash constituted less than 25% of the total consideration, right? If what? If the cash involved is 25% or more of the total consideration, then both parties, the receiver and the payer of cash, take the entire gain. Okay? All right, so let's just do this one more time. Transaction either has commercial substance or lacks commercial substance. If cash flows will change, has commercial substance, cash flows won't change, lacks commercial substance. Whether a transaction has or lacks commercial substance, always take the losses. That's it. Losses are always taken regardless. Okay? Transaction what? Transaction has commercial substance. Okay? Then what? If no cash is involved, nobody takes any gains, right? If, when well, we have a gain situation, right? You always take losses, but if cash, no cash is involved, then what? Then in transaction, now uh, transaction has commercial substance and uh, cash is involved, take the gain. But if the transaction lacks commercial substance and what? No cash is involved, nobody takes any gains, defer the gains. If cash is involved and the cash constitutes less than 25% of the total consideration, then only the receiver of the cash will take, and they will only take a portion of that gain. Whereas if I'm the entity that's paying cash in that situation, I won't take any gain. If the cash constitutes 25% or more of the total consideration, both parties take the entire gain. Okay? All right. So let's go ahead and let's just take a look now at a couple of uh, questions here, a couple of uh, examples here. And again, I think we've said this uh, now to where you're probably sick of it. What do we do with losses? Rule of conservatism says always take the entire loss immediately. Okay? Always recognize loss, the immediate, entire loss. Okay? But let's see what happens if we have a loss situation here, or let's see how it looks in an example, when we have a loss situation, and uh, you can see that uh, we've got this companies here, and they're involving in a non-monetary transaction, and so I want to turn this to yellow. Okay, so a used machine has a book value of 8,000, original cost of 12 minus 4,000, accumulated depreciation, and a fair value of eight. Okay, so you know you've got a loss situation here right off the gate because what? We've got fair value of six, book value of eight. We know we're going to have to take that entire loss of 2,000. We know that. Okay, now these give us some additional information because we're going to be looking at the entire journal entry for this situation. The new model lists for 16. And I'm going to get a trade-in allowance for my old machine of nine. And um, they give me some information down here, which um, they're basically doing all this so I know what to debit to bring on this new piece of machinery that I'm getting. I'm going to have to debit equipment. Now, I don't like the approach that they take here. I like to take an approach, okay, that I'm going to show you that helps me because I just have to remember how to do this every time and I do it the same 
the same every time regardless okay so to the the amount to bring on for the new machine whatever this thing is cost of new machine okay you could call this john's way whatever but i just think this is the way to do it is i always look at i take book value of assets surrendered book value of assets surrendered plus any gain recognized this is obviously a loss example but if it was a gain I would add the gain or minus any loss which is what we have in this situation okay so let's just look at that approach book value of assets surrendered and the book value of the machine okay book value of machine is what book value of machine is 8000 that's the old asset that I'm giving up book value of the asset given up I'm giving up that old machine 8000 that's the old machine right okay and then they told me that I had to pay some cash and the cash I have to pay is what the 7,000, the new machine listed for 16. They're giving me a trade in allowance of nine, so I'm gonna have to pay cash, and the book value of the cash, I'm giving up cash, the book value of my cash, obviously is 7,000, okay? And then my little formula says less the loss, I'm gonna subtract the loss, okay? And the loss is what? Is two thousand dollars right the eight thousand book value fair value is what only six that's a loss of two thousand okay and i come up with the same answer thirteen thousand okay i like this approach because this approach is going to work for us for most pretty much a hundred percent of the stuff that we're going to be looking at it still works in one case but we're going to have to look at it a little bit differently for one of the situations but for right here right now when we're calculating a situation in which we have a loss transaction we're not taking any gain uh we're not going to take any gain obviously it's a loss we're not in a gain situation we're in a loss situation we have to take that entire loss this is the way to figure out how to bring on the new machine. I don't like this over here. You feel more comfortable with this, go ahead. I like this little formula right here, okay? I would, I would use this, okay? I like this. All right, now, let's just go over though and see how this set of information now translates into a journal entry, and I will hold you accountable for making a journal entry for this kind of transaction, guys. There's an expectation that you know how to record a transaction like this. Now, I'm gonna number the items in this journal entry so that if I ask you a question as one of our format questions and I'm asking you, hey, what's the journal entry? The way for you to do the journal entry is to build it in pieces. Don't sit there and say, oh, I better think of the debits first, I better think of the credits first. Go with what makes the most sense to you. So, I would first credit the equipment, I know, you're supposed to put debits before credits, but no one's gonna cry if you stuck in your credit before your debit, figured that out first. So the equipment is what? The equipment has a, um, a original cost of 12, so it would have still been on the books at its original cost of 12, right? And the accumulated depreciation is four, since I'm getting rid of this asset now, because I'm trading it in, I'm going to have to credit that original purchase price for 12, I would go ahead and debit the accumulated depreciation because if I'm getting rid of the asset, I gotta get rid of the uh, related accumulated depreciation. The third thing I would do, hey, we know our cash. If I'm paying cash, I gotta credit cash for 7,000. I know that. I've calculated the loss. Again, the fair market value is less than the book value. That's a loss. I know I have to take that entire loss, so I debit the loss. 
And then the fifth line of this journal entry is what I bring the equipment on. I just showed you how to calculate that. But even if you got stuck and you couldn't figure it out from a fact pattern like this to do it the way I described to you here, I think you should use this approach, you could, of course it may not be the most efficient way to get the answer, you could put together the easy piece of the pieces of that journal entry and the last thing, the fifth line there that I'm talking about, could be something that just makes that journal entry balance. Okay? Okay, good. Now that's the loss situation. You come over and uh, what happens if we have a gain situation and the transaction has commercial substance. So now we got to start looking to see well how much of the consideration is being cash, is constituted of cash, etc. Okay, so we dealt with the loss situation. We're going to apply those rules that we talked about on the previous slide now here for the game. Always take 100% of the game. Doesn't matter if the transaction has commercial substance or not. We've got a gain and the transaction has commercial substance. What happens? Gain has commercial substance. Take the game, right? Okay, so you come over and uh, let's just take a look at the uh, fact pattern here. New fact pattern and we have what? We have the fair value of these trucks okay is 49 well let's just make sure we're clear on how the problem let's just read through the problem interstate transportation company exchanged a number of used trucks plus cash so they're paying cash for a semi truck uh, the used trucks have a combined book value of 42,000 okay which is the cost of 64 minus the accumulated appreciation of 22 right there okay and interstate purchase agency experience in the secondhand market indicates that the used trucks have a fair value of 49. Let's stop there. If the fair value is what? Is 49. And the book value is 42. Then we've got what? We've got a gain, right? Book value is more... Uh, Fair value is more than the book value. We've got a gain of seven thousand, don't we? Okay. How much of that gain are we going to take? Transaction has commercial substance. Take the entire gain. Okay. All right. Good. Now you come over, and they tell us that we must pay eleven thousand cash for the uh, semi truck. So we're going to have to give up those old trucks. We're going to have to pay some cash of eleven thousand. They give us the new truck. Okay. Now the question is. First, what should we bring? We've calculated the gain, that was first, but what should we bring the new truck on? And remember, my rule is what? Book value of the asset surrendered, right? Plus any gain or minus any loss, okay? So book value of assets given up is the 42,000. That's the book value of that uh, old trucks, the used trucks that I'm giving up. The what? I'll put old trucks there used trucks, whatever, old trucks, that says old trucks, not turkeys, but trucks. Ah, you know what I mean, okay? Then what? Then I have the um, cash. And then I have the gain. I'm going to write the gain in here. Blech. I have the gain, and the gain was what? We just calculated 7,000. I add all that up, hmm, cool, I get the same answer. I don't have to start messing around with what do I do and the gains and losses. I sit there and if I do that approach, I can get the value of that uh, new asset uh, consistently every time. You know, sometimes the hard part in understanding an area like this where you've got a bunch of different moving parts is to crystallize it down to a set of routine steps, okay? And that's what I'm trying to do with how you calculate the value of that new asset. So you take a look now, and we've got our journal entry. Let's just go ahead and number it again, which is to what? The trucks had a original cost of 64, accumulated depreciation of 22, okay? And then what? That's where we got the... Uh, the uh, basically the 42,000 uh, book value, okay? Then what? Then we go ahead and the next thing I would do is the cash. You know you had to pay 
cash. You got it, credit cash, um, 11,000. Okay, I would then bring on the gain. And then you saw in the previous slide using that little approach that I've been talking about, we can figure out what to bring the new trucks on. Okay. Okay, good. Now, let's go over that so far, what? Loss, take the entire loss, whether the transaction has commercial substance or not, right? Uh, gain, if the transaction has commercial substance, take the entire gain. We just did that, right? Now, what happens if the transaction lacks commercial substance and no cash is received? Well, now we're going to have to sit there and... Uh, <clears throat> um, defer that loss because there's no cash received, there's no cash involved, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and you can, that's what they tell us here, we defer the gain. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this gain, no cash is involved, okay? So let's just take a look, uh, no cash is received, I should say, no cash is received, okay? So let's just take a look at this, there is cash paid, but notice <clears throat> that, um, we have a gain and we are not taking that gain okay so in this transaction the gain was what this seven thousand but we're not going to take any of this gain because now uh because uh there's uh it lacks commercial substance and no cash was received cash was paid okay so notice right here guys all of a sudden and this is why i wanted you to stick with the way i wrote this the book starts as well you could do this or you could do that stick with the consistent method book value of asset surrendered which is what forty two thousand eleven thousand cash we're not taking any gain so we don't have to do the part of add or subtract gain if you're not recognizing that gain or loss so we end up with what we end up with the fifty three thousand that's that number there. We're going to do what? We're going to debit the trucks for the old value, credit the accumulated depreciation, credit the cash, because what? Because the cash is easy for us. And the fourth line of this entry is what we calculated right there. Book value of assets surrendered. Don't have to worry about gain or loss here because no gain or loss was recognized. Now, you're sitting there and you're saying, well, John, how do I know that they weren't supposed to recognize a gain or loss? I mean, I understand they said no cash received, but you said, I said earlier that if the cash constitutes what? 25% or more of the total consideration, then you would take the gain. Well, what happens? They're sitting there and um, they're showing us in this example that uh, let's just go back the cash well i'm going to just kind of put it here the cash constitutes what eleven thousand so that's in the numerator okay and then we're going to have the cash which cash fair market value is is equal to its book value right is eleven thousand plus the fair value of the truck that we've given up and the fair value of the truck that we've given up just going back to look at the fair value of that truck was what was 49 okay so if you sit there and you take 11,000 plus 49,000 okay and I thought I had written this calculation down somewhere at some point in time but apparently now I don't know where I wrote it so 11,000 right it is going to be divided by eleven thousand plus forty nine thousand eleven thousand plus forty nine thousand is sixty thousand sixty thousand i don't do anything without a calculator guys divided by eleven thousand eleven thousand divided by what sixty thousand okay is eighteen percent okay and so since that constitutes less, you know, 18.33%, whatever, okay, 18.33%. So since that constitutes what? The cash constitutes less than 25% of the total fair value of the consideration that was provided here, then that means that the person paying the uh, cash here will not recognize any gain. 
So again, they say, well, you know, no cash was received, therefore you shouldn't take the gain. I know that that's the way they like to talk about it. I want you to be a little more uh, diligent here in that it's not just so much the fact that no cash was received, it was that the cash that was paid, the cash involved, constituted less than 25% of the total fair value of the consideration. If it was more than 25%, then both the entity paying the cash and receiving the cash would have taken um, the entire gain. All right. Okay, good. So you always got to do that to make sure you're treating this gain situation properly. Okay. Now you come over and um, you take a look and what happens if some cash is received? Well, now the portion of that gain that will be take will be attributed to the percentage that's involved here. Okay, so some cash is received in this situation. So now they tell us that what? They tell us that we're going to sit here and, um, and really, guys, I want to make a quick note here. Cash received, you should really put involved, cash received, involved. Because again, if the cash involved in the transaction constitutes more than 25%, 25% or more of the total consideration, then both parties should take the entire gain, right? Okay. And um, let's just go ahead though, and let's just take a look at uh, how we're going to make this calculation. So we have what? We have a machine that we gave up, had fair value of 100000 Book value is what? Book value is 60, so we've got a gain here of 40,000. Do we want to take any of that gain? We know we will because cash was received. And when cash is received, you are going to take at least a portion of that gain. If it's less than 25%, take a portion. If it's more than 25%, take the entire gain. And also the entity paying the cash will also take the gain on that. Okay, so we've got this uh, Queenie Corporation. I think this might be a little bit of a repeat of the previous question. Queenie Corporation traded in used machinery with a book value of 60, okay, and a fair value of 100,000, uh, okay. So it receives in exchange a machine with a fair value of 90 plus cash of 10,000. So we got some cash here, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to sit there and we're going to take. 4,000 of that gain. We're only going to take a portion of that gain because the amount of cash that was received versus the total consideration is uh, less than 25%. Um, and just to verify that, I go ahead. Okay, we're accountants, guys. We verify things, right? 10,000 divided by what? Divided by 100,000. I can do that one without a calculator, constitutes 10%, we're less than 25%. So we're only going to take 4,000 of that gain in this situation. The entity paying the cash now is not going to take any gain. They only start taking gains on transactions that lack commercial substance when what? When the amount of cash involved in the transaction uh, is 25% or more of the total consideration. Okay, so we go ahead and um, they tell us here, uh, you know, the uh, 60,000, um, um, well, I, I don't like the way they're doing this, so I'm not going to get into this calculation. I just want to show you, remember, we have to figure out how to bring on the new machine, what value to bring it on, and our approach has been what? Book value of the assets given up. Um, plus any gain, minus any loss. Is that our rule? Okay, so what happens? Well, I know that the book value of whatever the machine was, whatever we're dealing with here, old machine, okay, was 60,000. Okay, now this is where you got to take my rule and twist it a little bit. We, though, did what? We turned some of that machine into cash. Okay, we had a book value of 60,000. We gave up what? We gave up the machine and we did turn some of it into cash. So if you do that, then you could take the cash 
received, which was 10,000. Okay. And you go ahead and now the net book value of old machine, the net book value, if you will, of the asset we surrendered is what? 50,000. The rule is plus the gain that we recognize, the rule I had you write in, was 4,000. We should bring the new truck in at 54,000. Okay, so yeah, that's what they did up here. Again, I like doing it this way because it keeps me consistent from situation to situation on how I'm going to calculate the value of the new asset that comes in. Okay, so now I can do my journal entry. Okay, which is what? Take the old machine off. Take off the accumulated depreciation of the old machine. Right? Book in the cash that's come in. And then the fourth line is to bring in the... Uh, the new machine, uh, actually, oh, way they did this like this, the gain is going to be my fourth line, which is the amount of gain that I determined to recognize based on that ratio of cash to the total fair market value of the consideration involved in the transaction. And then that fifth line is going to be uh, what I just calculated to bring in the new, new machine. Again, I'm hoping you don't have to get into making a full journal entry every time you're trying to calculate the value of the new machine. I'm hoping you can use that approach that I told you to have been showing you. But by the same token, um, you know, if you run into trouble, you could put together this journal entry, I think, pretty easily and uh, be in good shape to be able to uh, answer the question of the value of the new machine. Because I might ask you that in just a multiple choice question. Okay, all right, good. Okay, you can summarize the rules here. It's pretty much what we talked about. You can see these rules is probably a good slide for you to you know, have a handy and available for when you take your exams and stuff, um, which goes through the steps, but I think these examples are helpful, okay? So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and I'm gonna take a little break on my end, okay? <laughs> And so for your purposes, you might want to take a break right now. Um, but bottom line, um, you can just see that in a couple seconds, uh, we will continue on. Okay, but I'm just pause this for a second. Okay, guys, so let's go ahead now and uh, go through... This example um, dealing with non-monetary exchanges and um, what we're going to be looking at is the um, journal entries for the transaction now with the non-monetary mo non -monetary exchange looking at it from two different entities, same transaction, two different entities in, uh, engaging in a transaction with each other and see how the journal entries look from each side of the equation. Um, again, um, just to summarize what we're looking for in problems like this, do we have a transaction um, that has commercial substance or do we have a transaction that lacks commercial substance, right? Again, how do we determine if a transaction has or lacks commercial substance? Looking for the key description that the cash flows will change significantly as a result of the transaction or the cash flows, that means the transaction has commercial substance. If we say that the cash flows will not change significantly as a result of the transaction, then that transaction lacks commercial substance. Or, as we're going to see in the example, they're going to show how the transaction would be accounted for if it has commercial substance or lacks. Any problems I give you, uh, midterm problems or whatever that I give you, are going to have to tell you either the cash flow issue or we'll call out the transaction has or lacks commercial substance. Okay, so we got to figure that out first. Then we look and we ask ourselves, okay, is a transaction resulting in a gain or a loss? If the transaction results in a loss, boom, we're going to take the entire loss. We don't have to do any other uh, consideration that we know we have to take that entire loss. If the transaction uh, has commercial substance, okay, and we have what? We have a gain, take the entire gain. 
Okay, so losses, whether it has commercial substance or not, take the entire loss. Gains, okay, if the transaction has, com uh, has commercial substance, take the entire gain. Okay, now, where we start dealing with maybe a little more subtlety, maybe a little more complexity in the rules is what happens if the transaction um, has commercial substance, it's a gain, uh, or I should say the transaction lacks commercial substance and it's a gain, how do we handle that? Lacks commercial substance and we have a gain, okay? Now, if the cash constitutes 25% or more of the total consideration. We figure that out by putting the cash in the numerator, the cash plus the fair value of whatever else was exchanged, the non-monetary item that was exchanged in that transaction. If that percentage, that fraction is 25% or more, take the entire gain. So now we're down to what? Now we're down to the possibility the transaction lacks commercial substance and there's a gain and now we're in a situation where the cash as a percentage of the total consideration has fallen below that 25% threshold. Okay, what do we do there? If there's no cash involved, no gain. Okay, if cash is received by the entity, we will do what? We'll recognize a portion of the gain that is equal to that less than 25% that the cash represents of the total consideration. Okay. If what? If the entity has paid cash, no gain in that situation. Okay? All right, so let's just go through them, this example, and let's see what we come up with applying those various rules. Okay, and they ask us to prepare the journal entries um, that would be necessary considering the um, approach that I just outlined. Okay? Now, um, Again, remember the way we consider if there's a gain or loss, we take what? We take the fair value of the property, we compare that to the book value, okay? If fair value is greater, that's a gain. If the, what? Consider the fair value, if the book value is more, we consider that a loss, okay? Now, the way this uh, slide presents this gets a little bit... Uh, confusing. I don't care for that presentation. So I'm just going to show you the way I would do this. I've got the fair values of the two respective pieces of equipment right here for the Santana equipment. The fair value is 13.5 for the Delaware equipment. The fair value is 15.5. We've got what? We've got the cost of the equipment minus the accumulated depreciation. So that's going to give me book value of 18,000 for the Delaware company um, equipment and for the Santana equipment. I never do things without a calculator because I do and I make a mistake and then I'm upset. 28,000 for the equipment minus the 19,000, the accumulated depreciation gives that one a book value of 9,000. Okay, so we go ahead then and let's just take a look at that previous slide and uh, we have what fair value is 15.5 right fair value is 15.5 for the Delaware equipment and it has a what it has a book value of 18 okay so 15.5 is the Delaware equipment they're just saying they received that equipment who they receive it from they receive it from Delaware so as far as Delaware is concerned 15.5 right less the 18,000, we saw how we came up with that book value. That gives me a loss of 2,500 20, uh, for Delaware. The Santana equipment, again, remember, Santana is receiving, uh, Delaware is receiving this equipment from, uh, from Santana. So this was Santana's equipment minus the 9,000 book value gives me 4,000. 500 and that's a gain situation okay just showing you the way they presented that um, you know you could also if you wanted to sort of uh, set this up a different way you could say for Dell uh, for uh, Santana okay, I'm gonna just put an s there Santana they're the ones with the gain uh, their equipment had what had a book value of nine fair value of 13.5, 
that's where we got the 4,500 gain. And for uh, Delaware, their equipment had a book value of 18 and had a fair value of 15. Okay. Okay, and that's where they got that $2,500 loss. Okay, so the way they presented that gets a little confusing. That's the way I would come up with those numbers. Okay, so we know now we have a gain, we have a loss. Let's see how we're going to apply these now going through the scenarios of having commercial substance, not having commercial substance, etc. And see how that's going to affect our journal entries. Okay, so if the transaction has commercial substance, we know we're always going to take the entire loss. Okay, so let's just go ahead and start out with Delaware. We know they had a loss. We know we have to take that loss, right? Okay, Delaware had the loss. Just going back, Delaware, right? Delaware, I should have put a D there, is a company that had the loss, right? So we know they have to take the entire loss, the loss rule, right? Have to take the entire loss. Now, we want to figure out how, how we should uh, value the new equipment okay remember I say it's the what book value of the items that were given up plus any gain or minus a loss so we have a loss here so the book value was 18,000 for that equipment right just go back again make sure we're sure okay right Delaware had the loss the book value of their equipment was 18 okay so they had 18,000 there that they gave up now this is the situation where you have to look at it a little bit different. They turn some of that 18000 though, into what? Into cash. Okay, so when cash is received, you're going to go ahead and subtract the amount of cash that was received off of that to come up with the value because some of that equipment that they gave up, they turn into cash, right? So then we're left with what? We're left with a net for the... Uh, book value of the asset surrendered of 16, right? Had some asset come in, some go out. The net book value of the asset surrendered, I should say, 16. And then what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to go ahead and subtract the loss, 2,500. And that gives me what? That gives me the 13,500 here. Okay, 13,500. That's how we value the equipment. Then what? Then we go ahead and we finish the rest of this journal entry. Okay, so what happens? First thing I would do is debit the uh, credit the equipment for the original cost, debit the accumulated depreciation to get it off the books. I go ahead and I do my cash next. They receive cash, so we're going to go ahead and debit cash. 2000 we calculated the loss a minute ago on the previous slide so i would go ahead and debit that loss and then the fifth part of that journal entry maybe the hardest part if you couldn't come up with this which i think if you take the approach that i'm talking about that is even pretty easy but you would go ahead and maybe uh, balance your journal entry by the equipment okay okay good let's go ahead and let's take a look at um, the commercial, the transaction has commercial substance. We're going to take the entire gain. Santana was the company that had the gain, right? So now, how do we come up with the value that they should put for the equipment? It's the what? It's the book value of the assets surrendered. So they gave up a piece of equipment that had a book value of nine. Okay. Then what? Then they had the cash that they gave up that had a book value of 2,000, book value of assets surrendered, right? And then we go ahead plus any gain minus a loss. If we had a loss, we add that up and that gives us this 15.5. That's the amount that we put in for the equipment, right? Okay, so then again, we go ahead and build the journal entry. They got rid of the equipment that had original cost of 28. The accumulated depreciation was 19, right? Okay, then what? They had to pay cash, so I put the cash in there. I calculated the gain on the previous side, so I know I have to credit the gain. And then the fifth part of that journal entry would be for the equipment, okay? So I'm just showing you systematically how to go about these. We looked at this in the earlier example, and now we're just applying those rules again to this scenario, okay? So now we have what? Now we have the situation with Santana, if the transaction has commercial substance, transaction lacks commercial substance. So this is the same thing that we just saw 
a minute ago on the previous slide for Santana where we said the transaction had commercial substance. Let's that compare that now to the situation where it does not lack commercial, um, where it lacks commercial substance. And when it lacks commercial substance, now we have to go through the process to say, okay, um, we're now in a situation where we're not going to take any gain on that because the transaction lacks commercial substance. We don't take a gain because when we look at the cash that was received, cash that was received was what? 2000 And then we're going to go ahead and do what? Uh, excuse me, the cash that was, was paid here, the cash involved. And then we're going to divide that by the... Uh, the fair market value of um, everything that was received, which is the 2000 plus the fair market value. And let's see what the fair market value they told us was of the equipment. Fair market value of the equipment was what? Was 13.5. So we have 2000 times 13.5, 2000 divided by 15,500 gives me what gives me 13 percent so what happens we are below the 25 percent threshold transaction lacks commercial substance no cash was received right we paid cash we don't take any gain on that okay so when we sit here and calculate well how are we going to deal with the equipment again i like to take the approach of the book value of the assets that were surrendered. So what was the book value of the assets that were surrendered? And so again, you look, as we calculated earlier, we had what? We had the book value of the asset that was surrendered was nine, and then the book value of the cash was two, right? So you apply that rule, book value of the equipment was nine, book value of the cash was two, that's how they got that 11,000. That rule always works, okay? To do the rest of the journal entry or to figure out the rest of the journal entry, easy enough. Credit the equipment to get the equipment off the books. Debit the accumulated depreciation to get the accumulated depreciation on the books. I should say off the books there. Then we go ahead, we credit the cash for the cash that we paid. And the last thing we would do in this journal entry, the fourth line would be to uh, come up with the equipment. Again, if you use that approach of the book value of the asset surrendered, plus any gain, minus any loss, there was no gain or loss there. So it's just the 11,000, okay? Again, looking at it from Delaware now, if we lack commercial substance, Delaware had a loss. So Delaware has to do what? Delaware has to take the entire loss, loss rule, take the entire loss, right? Okay, so that's easy enough. Now we just wanna figure out what to bring the equipment on. And the equipment is going to be what? The book value of the uh, asset that was surrendered here. And so the book value of the asset that was surrendered gives us that 13.5. We get rid of the accumulated depreciation. So we'll do our journal entry. First, we get rid of the equipment. Then we get rid of the accumulated depreciation. We know we have to take the cash that's come in. We take what? We take the uh, entire loss. And then that last piece is the equipment, the 13.5. The book value of the uh, asset that was surrendered here um, was going to be that, uh, that equipment, the net book value of the equipment, okay? Okay, um, I mean that's pretty much uh, pretty much it for how we're going to deal with non-monetary transactions. All right. Okay, good. So let's go ahead then and uh, move into our last couple of areas here. Just uh, what we're going to do here is discuss how to deal with an asset after you've had that asset for a while and now you start trying to make improvements, et cetera, additions to that asset, repairs to that asset, how should you handle those, okay? So this is subsequent to acquisition. So let's go ahead and let's take a look. And uh, when we look, we can see that in general, cost incurred to achieve future guarantee or benefit should be capitalized whereas expenditures simply maintain the given level of service and those should be expensed, okay? So what they're really talking about there 
are, and I should probably put the word routine, repairs. Okay, so what happens? You have a vehicle. You have to repair a flat tire. Well, that's a routine, normal repair. You don't have to capitalize the cost of that tire by debiting asset. You would simply debit expense, credit the cash that you paid for the repair of that tire, okay? Conversely, if you do what? If you did something like had a um, extraordinary repair, Okay, so now what? You overhaul the engine of that vehicle. So you take all the engine parts out and you replace them with new engine parts, etc. Well, that's now an extraordinary repair. So instead of sitting there and debiting expense, you would do what? You would debit the asset account. You would capitalize that. When we say capitalize, we mean debit the asset account. That debiting to the asset account is going to bring up the... Um, the carrying value of that asset okay so in order to capitalize costs we're going to have to meet one of these requirements down here okay so let's just take a look at that the useful life must be increased hey if i overhaul the engine now i'm going to be able to drive that vehicle say another hundred thousand miles because i put a brand new engine in there right the quantity of units produced must be increased now i can drive that vehicle another hundred thousand miles so the usefulness has been increased I can go and I can um, make deliveries now that I couldn't make before because before the truck couldn't go uphill my delivery truck couldn't go uphill now it's more useful um, because the uh, life has been increased I can drive it now a longer period of time I can drive it more miles quality of units produced must be enhanced and so I can now, and it doesn't have to be all three, it only has to be one of the three, but now just to go on with that delivery truck example, I can use it for long uh, distance deliveries, etc. Okay, okay, good. So we come over and when we look at costs subsequent to acquisition, we can have an addition. Hey, we added a wing to the building, capitalize it improvements or replacements we replace the engine uh, we put a better engine a more high performance engine i don't know if you have a delivery truck with high performance but whatever we have a high performance um, engine in there now because we want to drive fast and perform well in our delivery trucks kind of silly but it's going to be an improvement capitalize that okay rearrangement reinstallation okay so we're going to move it from one location to another we're going to move it around the factory capitalize that repairs are expenditures that maintain the asset for a condition or operation again changing the oil you don't capitalize that you would expense that okay all right good so let's just go ahead and take a look at how to handle these items and i'm just going to go through one of them with you because it starts to repeat itself as to how you handle these okay so we say capitalize the cost of the addition okay it's an addition and we say if the carrying value of the asset is known, remove the old cost and the related accumulated depreciation from the old asset and then go ahead and bring in the cost of the improvement, whatever that is. Okay, now let's just go ahead and uh, when you remove, by the way, the accumulated depreciation and the, um, and the uh, book value, you would have to recognize a gain or loss at that point and then capitalize the cost of improvement. So let's just see, well, what do they mean the carrying value is known? So let's say I buy um, an asset and I have its carrying value sitting there, I get rid of it. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do what? I'm gonna take off the old book value, debit the accumulated depreciation, credit the asset, recognize any gain or loss, and then bring the cost of the new asset on. Easy enough. But here we say the carrying value is unknown. And you're like, well, how would the carrying value be unknown? Well, let's say I buy a building and it has a roof on it when I buy it, and then I have to replace the roof. Well, I don't know what the carrying value of the roof was because when I bought 
the building, the roof was there. I don't know what the carrying value of the roof was. So what do I do? In that case, I wouldn't know the carrying value of the roof that I just replaced on my building. And so they tell us if the asset life is extended, then debit the accumulated depreciation for the cost of the improvement, thus bringing up the carrying value of the building. And they tell me to do that because if I put a roof on a building, I probably have extended its useful life, right? Okay. Now we say if the quantity or quality of the asset is increased, then take the cost of the uh, addition and placement improvement and put that what? Put that into the asset account. So now the cost of that roof, if I somehow knew the book value of that roof, the cost of that roof would be of the new roof would be added to the carrying value. Uh, by increasing the asset account directly. Okay. Okay, good. So I'm not going to go through each one of these because they start the same thing over again. Rearrangement, reinstallment, if it's known, unknown. Uh, repairs, if it's ordinary, as we've already said, expense it. If it is major, then go ahead and uh, treat that as an addition. Go ahead and capitalize it, debit the cost of that repair to the asset account. Okay. Okay, good. That takes us up now to um, how to deal with our uh, sale uh, of our property, plant, and equipment. Okay, and we've been dealing kind of already with exchanges. Okay, but let's see what happens if we have an involuntary conversion or an abandonment. And let's see if we just have a straight sale. We're not exchanging it for another asset, okay? So the key issue here is that when you have a description of a situation where they've been depreciating something and then they sell the property, and let's say they sell the property halfway through the year, the 10th year is the year they're gonna sell and they sell it half the middle of that uh, 10th year, then your first step is to catch up your depreciation, okay? so. If we were taking, what, $1,200 per year, then to catch up our depreciation in year 10, we would go ahead and we would debit the depreciation expense for half of the full year, 600, credit the accumulated depreciation. So now we can go ahead and make the journal entry for the disposal of that asset. And so we sold it for, what, uh, $7,000 cash, okay? And so what are we gonna do? We're going to go ahead and debit the cash for 7000 obviously. Get rid of the accumulated depreciation. It's 1200 per year for years one through nine, 600 for the half of year 10. The machinery comes off at its original cost and then the gain on disposal of the machinery is going to be its book value minus the cash. So, um, been nice of them to help us to calculate that, but uh, we're big boys and girls. We can do that ourselves, okay? So it's what? It's the 18,000. Yeah. Let me change off a highlighter. Okay. Sorry, guys, it's a little annoying, but uh, let's just go ahead. Okay, see what's going on here. Let me put this to pen. Let me make it red. Gonna make me go through all the hoops here, okay? All right, good, so let's go ahead and let's just take a look at this one that we were looking at here a minute ago, okay? And so we have what? We have the original cost of 18. We have the accumulated depreciation of 11.4. Okay, 18,000 minus 11.4 because the book decided that we should be able to see that in our head what they did there. 18 minus 11,400 once we had caught up the depreciation was 6,600. We sold it for what? We sold it for 7,000 cash. The difference between the cash that we sold it for and its, um, and its book value at the time of the sale is four hundred dollars okay just showing you where that came from and maybe you saw that in your head i don't my head doesn't see things like that i don't see those kinds of things in my head so i like to check out the calculations like that okay okay good now if you have a situation 
now where you have an involuntary conversion. What does that mean? Now the government comes to you and they say, we're going to put a super highway right through the middle of where your building goes. So here's some money. You're giving up the building. They call that eminent domain. Okay. Well, if something weird like that happens, okay, then you would simply go ahead, take in the cash, okay, take the asset off and the difference between the book value of the asset, which was apparently 300,000 versus the cash they gave you in that situation, which was five, ends up being a gain. Let's hope they don't put us in a loss situation for something like that. Okay. All right, guys, good work. That's a long lecture. I'm going to stop there. There's a few more slides at the end. I don't think you need to really worry about those. I'm going to stop right here, okay? Um, and um, you will now soon be seeing the posting of the quiz, um, practice midterm for this chapter, practice midterm for this chapter, and I'll be posting lectures where I'll go through those practice midterm items for you, okay? All right, guys, thanks for your patience. Hope you uh, got some good tips on how to deal with the, your assets. If you haven't already looked at chapter 11, we're gonna deal with depreciation in chapter 11, okay? All right, guys, talk to you soon. <laughs>